welcome in a new episode of Interviews with Indie Developers. Last time we went into an emotional roller coaster at the Forest Quartet, and this time we are going to go a bit more upbeat because we are going to the 80s and we are going to discuss publishing, copywriting, and anything that you wanted to know about Rough Justice. So I'm not going to let you wait any longer because here is Jeremiah and he knows a lot. Welcome in the studio, I'm very excited. Uh, I just already have one of my very attentive viewers who was like, wait a minute, is this game connected with the BBC series from uh, 1890s, uh, which is called Rough Justice? No, it is not. <laughs> <laughs> it's not, okay. So, okay, that has nothing to do with the game. What has, no, but we, what? we were actually nervous about that because when we wanted to secure the, um, the copyright for the game, you know, of course, you, you, know, you look up all the different possibilities and the the show the tv show came up and there's also a clothing brand called rough justice as well funnily enough um, but how the copyrights work is that you put it in and then they have x amount of time to respond and to say no that's our copyright so our copy went right went through we got it for rough justice and also rough justice 84 which is okay so it is still an interesting uh, thing to know is that oh wait a minute there has been something with a similar name uh on there so uh, there's also a banana rama song and there's yes. also a rolling stone song as well <laughs> yes. um, yeah. How was that with the licenses? So if you're applying for a copyright license, um, you need to pick the category that you're choosing it for. And because there's no other game out there that already has an existing copyright, there is no copyright infringement. And so if, if we're not doing a clothing line or a TV show based on the title, then we're, we're good. And because it's just a game, then... Also, I know it's like it's very inspired by a board game, right? Or is it just the feeling that I get from it? Well, I mean, we're all board game players. We love playing board games. And I mean, funnily enough, a few people have said, like, uh, actually, one review, they're like, this game is uh, very different than the original board game it was based on. And I'm like, uh, <laughs> you're, yes, it is very different, but that board game doesn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> nice one. <laughs> you know, we've actually gone so far as to, when, in our game design, you know, we were planning it out kind of as a board game just for um, the development. And uh, that really helped us to visualize the flow of the game, the whole loop of the game. And we even went so far as to, we were thinking about doing a, a actual board game version of it of Rough Justice, because it makes sense, you know, it's cards, it's dice, Yes. you have your agents, you have your cases, um, so it all the working parts are there to make a, a board game. But I mean, it isn't based on a particular board game, it's just our own, it's heavily inspired by board game logic. When did you thought, okay, I want to make this game kind of board game likey? I think the, the major point was, of course, when you're bringing in the use of virtual dice, you know, how are you resolving these cases? In, in Rough Justice, you have the two options. You have the utilization of puzzles, which are relying heavily on your motor skills and your logical thought processes. And then you're also relying on dice. It's up to luck to a certain degree, but I mean, you can argue that any dice game is up to luck. Um, but it also is, uh, in Rough Justice, it comes down to strategy. Are you sending the right agent mm -hmm. that is qualified to do this? Do they have the right equipment? Do they have enough action points so you can enable more dice usage? I do realize that some people are like, oh, it's too RNG-ish. I mean, sure, you know, That's even right. if sometimes there's like a 98% chance of you succeeding, there's still a 2% <laughs> chance of you failing. And of course, Murphy's Law, you know, you're going to fail. At one point in the development, we actually had the percentage success chance of those rolls up there. And it really frustrated people because in our minds as humans, we think to ourselves, 60%. That's almost like a hundred percent, you know? <laughs> yes. And so when you have it up, they're like, what the hell? I lost that role. I had a 60% chance or I had a 70% chance. It kind of messes with your mind because, you know, yes. if someone says to you, well, you've got a 60% chance of surviving cancer and you're like, well, shit, that's good, isn't it? I mean, it's better than a 2% chance. And so you, you think to yourself, I'm going to live. But yeah, that isn't always necessarily the case. I didn't mean to go so dark there with cancer, but uh, I think... <laughs> Well, the game is also very dark, to be honest, so uh, I have, uh, like, you even can kind of play the bad cops in, in itself. So this is my also view that it has a bit of a feel of uh, sleeping dogs combined with n uh, 911 simulator. Are those games 
inspirations or is that just my imagination? You're talking 911 operator? Yeah, yeah, operator. Yeah, okay. I think one of the initial inspirations was 911 operator. Um, this idea of, you know, you are controlling this group of agents and sending out to do tasks. And we took that as an initial concept and we expanded upon it. I mean, you can also say that one of the initial inspirations was this is the police, only because it's the, this isometric uh, map view and you're sending your cops out or agents in our case to, to do tasks. But with ours, you're not just doing it in a sense. So it is time-based, but time isn't the only factor. It all comes down to to your roles, your the strategy that you imply and um, um, utilize, and also if it was a puzzle, then your your logical or your ability to successfully complete the puzzle. But yeah, I mean, we took a lot of inspirations uh, from many different games, Contract. for sure. Yeah, I just I and for for example, I think like I just realized how much in depth it was when I was trying to play it like very casually. Immediately, I was like, wait a minute, I should have maybe done this and that and that yeah, and yeah. this and that. So <laughs> it isn't a casual game, especially if no. you're the on the onboarding. You know, one thing that we've definitely learned is that in order for you to completely understand the game logic, and it's not overly complicated, but there are many, many different smaller elements. And if you don't understand them from the get go, you're going to have a bad time. For us as developers, this is our first game, um, and I think the the onboarding, showcasing these tutorial pop ups, it was important. But I think we started with the narrative integration of these concepts too late in the game. So. So it takes you a long time to get on, maybe a half an hour to get on board to understand, okay, this is it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's not a slow process. It does introduce one mechanic after another, but in quick su succession. And I think some people, they want the quick fix. How do I play this game? And then if you don't tell them everything in the first 10 minutes, they're gonna be like, well, this is a piece of shit, or it's too complicated. This isn't a casual game. The thing is, once you get over that point of saturation and you understand it, it can turn into a casual game once you understand the mechanics. Those are things you learn through time. For our next game, the onboarding process will definitely be a little bit different. <laughs> yeah, because it was like uh, a lot of text, just clicking away, text, 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 and then you're late, late like, uh, maybe I should have read more of the text. <laughs> A hundred percent. You want yeah. to get the meat, right? So, um, yeah. yeah, you were also saying like, this is your first game. Like how big is the team? So there are six of us in the core team. We ballooned to about 25 people in the middle of production. We had a number of 2D artists. You'll see for all the different cases, there's multiple backgrounds. There's probably like over 80 different scene backgrounds just for the cases, day and night, depending on the time of day, the scene uh, takes place, the case takes place. Also with the the narrative storytelling, we have a lot of different backgrounds with all the different characters. So yeah, I mean, it's it was a small team. The core team is small, only six of us. Um, and then we had, like I said, about 25 people for about 10 months altogether. That was when it kind of ballooned. So um, we didn't need that many people in the beginning. We didn't need that many people at the end. How do you get such a easy game in on the market though? Because it is indeed a, a game that you really need to go very in depth before you're going to enjoy it, right? So it's hard to pitch, for example. I think one of the saving graces for our game is the puzzles. That's easy to understand. Mm -hmm. And if you want a quick fix, you can just go to the training center and you can try these puzzles. And I think that hooking people with this concept of bespoke era and genre specific puzzles is interesting because I think all the puzzles that we've come up with are are unique. I mean, sure, there are uh, exceptions to the rule in the sense that, for instance, the lockpick puzzle. I mean, how many different ways can you do a lockpick puzzle? You know, uh, it, it, <laughs> in some ways similar. It has been done to, a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it's definitely different than the one from Skyrim. But for instance, the polygraph, a puzzle, it's one of my favorite ones, actually. And this concept of having to answer incorrectly, is the sky blue? And of course, your brain says, well, duh, yeah, the sky is blue. But in order to, to trick the polygraph machine, you need to answer incorrectly. And that was a very, very simple question. But a lot of times you'll have double or even triple negative questions that really like hurt your brain thinking about it. And then you've got the, the timer and uh, you can only get X amount of these wrong. Yeah, I think that definitely makes it a lot more interesting for sure. But I mean, again, it's um, this isn't checkers. It's, it's a chess game. It is a, I wouldn't say it's a, it's a grand strategy game, but strategy is involved. I mean, look, if any other game, you know, if you look at XCOM, XCOM requires you to understand the basic logics of the game, you know, and any of these bigger games, this isn't a casual game in that regard. And sure, you're going to um, have people that want that quick fix and to quickly understand, but it is an, an arcade game. Mm -hmm. So 
um, I think most strategy games are going to suffer with that. If you play Civilization, you know, there's like if you want to play Civilization properly, you're going to have to go through the tutorial for like three hours and really until you completely understand it. So yeah, that's probably uh, one of the standard things with strategy games. Yeah, yeah, what was the biggest challenge of making this game? I think the biggest challenge for us really came down to finances. You know, you have a vision and then you need to say, okay, what can we do with X amount of money? Because if you're looking to a publisher or an investor, they're going to want to know how much you, do you want and when are you going to deliver the product and when can we start making money on it? Mm -hmm. And I think for us as, as a small team, especially also hiring other people, you, know, you think 25 people and you think, well, that's going to be a lot of money. You know, how are we going to pay for all these people? And then you want to have a good, good game plan. And I think the biggest challenge for us was Confucius always said, you know, measure twice, cut once. Right. And, and I think we definitely want to make sure that we measured three times or four times because those are big, big choices you're making. And especially for, again, an inexperienced team. Did we do everything right? No, but we got it across the finish line. We, we finished it. And I think this theoretical planning without real life experience is terrifying. You're like, how long is it going to take us to do it? I don't know, six months, eight months. 12 months 24 months who knows it's like how long is a piece of string how do you calculate these things mm -hmm, yeah. and you, you, know, you go into the finite things like well how long does it take 2d artists to make a character that isn't just like a, a lump sum answer you need to think okay well what is the quality that you're looking for what are the defining features is it going to be modular or not you know these are all different things and then you actually have to put in a price point on each of these assets and then scale it up you're like well how many agents are we going to have we're going to have 50 agents and then 50 times x and then you can figure out well how long does take to do each agent and then i'm horrible at math but you need to kind of like it's all about math though you know like when can we realistically finish all these agents and all the backgrounds that we have and do all the different puzzles you know and even with the puzzles you can't even say okay well it costs x amount of money to make one puzzle and you need to have four people on it one for the um the asset creation the 3d asset creation one for the game design one for the coding and uh, and, and someone to do, do qa um so You know, you can't say, well, it's going to take six weeks on average to make, but then it all comes down to the, the price point. And then, yeah, that was probably one of the biggest challenges, I think. This isn't a run, run and gun game. This isn't a roguelike. This isn't a one specific genre. And I think the game suffered heavily to a certain degree because we tried to bring many, many different things in there. It's a narrative game. There's puzzles in the game. It's a dice rolling game, it's a management <laughs> game. And I think we suffered a little bit from an identity crisis because we tried to do too many things. Because what we didn't want to do is say, okay, this is a 911 operator knockoff, or this is a, this mm -hmm. is the police knockoff. And we wanted to create something new. And of course, having a USP in there is important. You don't necessarily have to redesign the wheel, especially for your first title, but again, that's a beginner mistake, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yes. Yeah, because you say you struggle with the finance. So, so you because I noticed that you went to a lot of you went to a lot of events. Then how do you cherry pick the right events, or like did they influence like your finance? You know, we were very uh, hopeful, and you know, maybe other people have different experiences than, than we we've had. Um, but yeah, we were very much out there. We went to lots and lots of different events, and we actually won a lot of different awards for the game before it was re even released. We won the Epic Mega Grant. We were given the grant. Uh, Mega, epic mega grant we won the indie game cup we won, won the nordic game discovery contest last year and these are all great accolades you would think to yourself well you've got this list of these you know 15 20 different accolades um you've been to all these really cool events what gives you need to have 50 <laughs> yeah i don't know it's like and at the end of the day you know none of those things actually mattered when getting signed with the publisher they didn't give it a crap i mean There's many, many different types of publishers out there, but some of them do their due diligence and they're just like, okay, we're going to check the numbers and we're going to compare this, do a market comparative analysis. Um, and it puts us in a very awkward situation because when you're talking about the valuation of, of a product with an unproven team, anything that you come up with is going to be your guessing, basically. And so relying on the gut feeling from a publisher, if a publisher says, okay, I like it, here's the money. You know, that's one way of doing it. Or someone says, okay, well, we're going to compare this to all these different games and how, see how they did. And, you know, maybe you're going to be right, maybe you're going to be wrong. At the end of the day, we found a, a publisher who took a risk on us, you know, and, and it is a risk. You know, you're yeah. giving money, you're, you're not giving money, but you're investing money into a project, into an unproven team, you know, and not having that track record or the pedigree long enough in the industry. So you don't really know what you're going to be getting. Life is about risks. 
I suppose, you know, and, and, and also just because you give five million to uh, a team of AAA developers isn't guaranteeing that you're going to get a return on your investment because that game could drop, you know, flop big time. You know, we've seen so many, so many inter- instances of this happening. It's all a crapshoot. It's all a crapshoot. Yeah. <laughs> Fits in the team. Yeah, the theme is very interesting. Like, like because before I was going to play the game, you were like, yeah, there, there's like a full Wikipedia and it's like full of 84 kind of, well, like hidden acts. Like what are your favorite hidden acts of uh, 84? From 1984? Uh, yeah. Well, I think, you know, it was our intention to make a game that uh, appealed to two different types of people, at least from a atmospheric perspective. So you had people who are elderly gentlemen like myself who actually <laughs> lived in the 80s and knew what it was like mm-hmm. and then you've got people who weren't even born in the 80s or maybe even in the 90s you know and you have this like this nostalgic view of what the 80s would have been could have been like which is very very neon oriented and i mean not everything was neon back then but i think appeasing both of these types of people was our goal it's a very very fine line though because you know you don't want it to be it's not a realistic type of game you know it's not like we're not using unreal meta humans and things like that it's a very stylistic game so i think that was one of our biggest challenges to draw the line and i think a lot of that comes through with the writing kind of references like if you didn't grow up in the 80s you have no idea what parachute pants are you know necessarily you know yeah there you go you know uh <laughs> that they were huge you know if you didn't have a pair of parachute pants when you were in fourth grade you were a loser you know it's like <laughs> okay. um you know and of course they were super expensive you know or beanie babies and of course interestingly enough a lot of the cultural references are product based and so but you got to be really careful with that you can't say beanie babies or you can't say the a team necessarily you have to make inadvert reference to those things so you don't get you know sued <laughs> Oh, but even with those products, because like it's like it sounds like the flippos from <laughs> from my time, to be honest. Yeah. So I don't think like if you say flippos in the game, then it's suddenly a content fragment. But maybe I'm I'm wrong about that. Yeah, I mean, you got to be super careful. I mean, Beanie Babies was a bad example because that was from the 90s. But yeah, you need to be careful with those references because, you know, very well could be that they don't have a problem or your game is so niche nobody even knows about it and it never is, it becomes, you know, a point of content. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, you know, it's always good to be aware of those things. Copyright content. We have a lot yeah, about yeah. Copy content, uh, copyright mm-hmm. content. So that was kind of a theme in, in between, basically. Well, you know, and I think a lot of people um, who go out and say, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a, a, a game. Being a game developer, especially for me, I'm, I was a project lead, I oversaw saw everything for the game. Sure, we're a team, but at the same time, it's like if you're a 2D artist on the team or you're a technical artist on the team or the, even the art director, or like even a coder, you know, you have your particular aspect of the game that you're working on and that's it. Sure, we can, can communicate with each other as a team and we can, we can say, okay, well, this isn't working. And even if that isn't necessarily your wheelhouse, you can give an opinion about something. Mm-hmm. But there's two different things. If you are the project lead and that's your company, like in the case with, with me, you need to think about a lot of a lot of different things. I probably should have prepared myself a lot better for it, you know, to think of the whole it's business development, basically. It's a necessary evil. It's super important. You need to make those contacts. You need to put together a budget proposal. You need to put together all those different things and reach out. But the more time you invest doing those business development uh, aspects, it's the less time you're developing the game. And I think initially... You know, I was very, very naive and I was like, I'm just going to make a game, you know, but it's not as easy as that. And so for me, the important thing was that I'm finding this balance that, it, you know, I, what I didn't want or what I don't want is that like 10% of my time is actually making the game and the rest is doing the business development. I'd much prefer it to be the other way around, but you need to be flexible in that regard. For instance, now we're, we're uh, planning out our next project. Yeah, we are working on the prototype for it. We'll be reaching out to investors and publishers to, to pitch it as well. And so is there a sneak peek? No, 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 no. <laughs> Not going to happen. Not going to happen. No, no fee, no. Nothing. No, nothing. Nothing about it. Oh, that's, um, that's sad. <laughs> yeah, but again, you know, it's uh, it's important to for us to keep that under the hood and uh, be a little bit secretive about it. Because, you know, we, we always, I think with Rough Justice, what we did was we went out 
very early and we should, we were very transparent with our development process. You can go through our Twitter account and uh, you can see everything that we've done from the, from the beginning. So there's something to be said for that. And that was important for us because we didn't have a publisher in the beginning. We needed to get some buzz, you know, and there are many, many cases of someone posting something on Twitter and their, their game development process, even very early on. And it just blows up. And then all of a sudden they get signed by a publisher and they're very, very early, early on in the development, which is great. You know, we were hoping for that. That didn't happen, which is okay. It's like playing the lottery, I suppose. Yes. Um, but there's also the other double-edged sword, the other side of things where a game comes out of left field and you've never even heard about it. And you're like, what? This game is already polished and is going to be releasing in three weeks? I've never even heard about it. And so you, it's another way of creating that buzz. And I think that because we've already released a game, I mean, who knows what's going to happen at the, at the end of the day, but because we've already released a game, we have a certain pedigree now where we're, yeah, we can probably hopefully find a publisher for our next game when we're ready to do that. Yeah, because we've, we've proven that we can bring something to market. So you don't want to ask the same publisher then? You're like, oh, I'd rather just find another publisher or just stay with the same or like... How I mean, it's definitely like a possibility, um, but this, our next game, it's game mechanic wise, it, it does have some similarities, but it's not the same theme or genre. We are being very aware of the fact that, you know, if we were to make a completely different type of game, anything that we learned through making Rough Justice 84, would be, I wouldn't say for not, but you know, we definitely, we want to take over a lot of the stuff that we've learned from Ruptures 84 and expound upon it, make something new. You know, we're not rehashing this and reskinning it. It's going to be a completely different game. It took us like over two years to make Rough Justice and we kind of like, we're glad we're done over with it for now. We'd like to move on to something else because even though I love the 80s, I'm very glad that our next game does not take place in the 80s. You know, it's like, <laughs> it's like oversaturation, like every single day for over two years. So okay. yeah. You are a small yeah, studio, right? Small so studio. did you like work hybrid or is there on a location because I see behind you there's your desk was is that your like your desk desk or is there like a company involved or so yeah I mean it's our company Gamma Minus uh, mm -hmm. we're based in Dusseldorf Germany but we are a remote team we were even a remote team before the whole pandemic started two of us in Germany and the rest are in England Portugal and France but and the funny thing is not that? freelancers or just like real party like real members of the club real members of the club you know okay. yeah oh, it's very diverse didn't yeah. it influence the game like having so many different cultures that was a challenge that we had because i'm the only american on the team and this game takes place in america in the 80s so so all the questions goes to you <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> there was three different authors on the game and only one of the other authors was another american the other two were brits and so we actually had to proof check a lot of their stuff for you know britishisms of course but also <laughs> cultural things because they were both younger you know mm. do you always think like oh like even the language like there are some things that you're like oh in america we would ne never say this and in english yeah. is like ah uh, well, what are you talking about so oh, that's <laughs> interesting <laughs> i think when it comes to when we're talking about the narrative aspect of the game the story it's without getting too much into detail there's a huge huge narrative twist in the game and what we didn't want to do is we didn't want to come out out of the door and just like and give everything away it's a slow slow burn mm. and then i think when you get to like operation three which is probably like about six hours in eight hours in it's gonna like blow your mind this huge twist and you're like what the? we really really could have used this plot twist from a marketing perspective that probably would have made the game a lot more edgy you know and a lot more press coverage because of it but we chose not to because it's a very, very delicate theme. I also think that experiencing that plot twist firsthand, it's it's super important for the game. And if you already know about it beforehand going into it, you know, it's kind of like deflates the whole power of it. You know, I think this whole slow burn element, in hindsight, we probably should have done the story twist maybe a little bit sooner to get people hooked. But I think we were just like, oh, or, you know, we're going to, this game takes like 25 hours to complete, 25 to 40 hours. And so we're just going to pace it out. And that's what we did. So and what are you proud of if you look at the whole project? Like, what are you like, whoa, I really achieved this? Because, again, we were a noob team, we hadn't brought anything to market. <laughs> I think one of the biggest achievements we had was when we had a bit of an existential crisis with the project. There was a point oh, where... We had money for the project and all of a sudden we didn't have any money for the project. 
and we had to like let a lot of people go. I think up until that point, I was of the opinion that it's my way or the highway. So I'm the project lead. This is my vision. This is what we're doing. You know, if you have an opinion, awesome. But at the end of the day, it's my call. And during this crisis where we had to let a lot of people go, we had a very, then we were left with like six to six of us then. And we had a really tough time trying to pick up the pieces. How are we going to be moving forward? How are we going to get further financing for the game? Mm -hmm. and, and how are we going to develop the game with so few people? And um, we had a bit of a, a fight, you know, like, which is, you know, yeah, but how are things going to move forward? And I think for me, it was a very enlightening process. And I'm so glad that it happened because I realized it was like, it's it's not about my ego and it's not about me. Sure, I, I'm the guy who signs the checks, you know, but at the end of the day, it's a game that we're making together. Mm -hmm. And to to pigeonhole people and just say, well, this is how we're doing it. And you're doing the coding and that's it. I don't care about your opinion. That is a really asinine way of being, you know, developing a game. You know, it's it's our game and having more opinions is great, you know. And I think a lot of people who are in my position, I've been on other projects before where it's a, it's a collective idea. Everyone has equal value and rights. And then these projects, never nothing ever happens. It doesn't ever see the market because too many opinions. And I think that was my biggest fear. So I figured, okay, if you know, you need to have the vision holder, someone who has a vision and everyone goes along. But I think there are different, definitely different ways of developing a game. And so I think I'm most proud of the fact that, and not to toot my own horn, but that my team and I we worked our differences out together and we became more of a, a cooperative development vision holders and uh, not just they're just doing the work. Because, you know, if you have people that are just doing the work, they're not going to think outside the box. They're not going to be like, oh, well, this could lead to this issue or this issue and this issue. They're like, all right, well, whatever. I'm just going to do this game. I'm going to do, do the thing. That's the way they want the 3D assets. It doesn't make any sense, but I'm going to do it anyways. And once you get to the point mm -hmm. where people are, say, say that to themselves, they're just going to not be motivated, yeah. you know? And then the, what they're going to be doing, it's, it may work at the end of the day. Who knows, you know? But I think it was important for us because we want to continue working together. Um, that inner team communication is super, super important. And also it, in valuing each other and understanding that, you know, everyone has a role to fill and everyone takes a point on, on one aspect of the game. But... You know, we want to make a game that we're all proud of. And uh, I think that's probably the most, what I'm the most proud of, for sure. Oh, that's really, that's, that's a nice story. That's, uh, <laughs> that's <laughs> something uh, totally un unexpected. Okay. Yeah. Because it was such a small team and also like so far away. So I guess that's also with the miscommunication, I guess, also with being like not on the same location and stuff? Well, I mean, you know, we have daily stand-ups every day. We use Discord for everything. We try to use, always use video calls. But yeah, I mean, I, the funny thing is, you know, I haven't met, I've only met half my team in real life. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah. And also with a lot of the team members, I've worked with them for many, many years, even before Rough Justice on other projects and also a project that we started before Rough Justice, which actually led to us making Rough Justice, our baby, our um, our magnum opus. We actually started to work on a asymmetrical first person zombie shooter. And uh, it is a lot different than Rough Justice, of course, right? Mm -hmm. And we got to a point where we had pitched it to many different publishers and investors and things were looking good. Like I met with all, all the top dogs and we actually have a multiplayer network replicated prototype and we're playing it with these these people that have a lot of money and uh, the decision makers, <laughs> multiple play sessions. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, everyone's complaining about game development and how hard it is. And I'm like, Pfft. you know, I started making this prototype a year ago. We, we know now we're talking to like the biggest publishers in the world and we're talking about budgets and stuff like that. And I'm like, well, this is easy. But at the end of the day, it fell through with the, all of them. And, uh, and the reason, because, because we didn't have the experience, you know, you could have the coolest idea in the world, but the carrying it through and bringing it across the finish line to a, a quality standard that this publisher requires, that's a huge risk that you're putting, you know, giving yeah, to a, sure. a, a team that doesn't have the experience. And of course the budget that we, that we were requesting, I was happy with the budget we put together. You know, it was really well put, put together, but it was a hell of a lot of money and that's too much of a risk. And like in hindsight, I'm thinking to myself like, well, thank God no one did that because we, you know, we, could have really screwed that one up so what we did was instead of like continuing to beat a dead horse we did a 180 and we said, said to ourselves okay all these publishers are saying there's red flags when they look at us we don't have the experience we're doing a multiplayer game for our first game we're doing an yes, asymmetrical game for our first game. Is, is a big red, red flag yeah. for, for 
book publishers. Yes, yes. Okay. And so basically, all we did was we we designed the concept of rough justice based on these red flags. You know, we're not doing a multiplayer game. We're not. You know what I mean? We're not doing uh, heavy 3D assets. And so, was it a game of passion? At first, no, not at all. It was just like a means to an end. We're going to make a lower budget game, you know, not millions and millions of dollars, but a realistic budget, a shorter time frame, smaller team. And then we did it. And that's exactly what we, we wanted to do. And that's what we did. So we can make other types of games. That's our goal. And eventually go give back to our magnum opus. Which oh, is due to our heart. Okay, I see. Yeah. So paving the way to get a hundred percent, a hundred percent. Okay. Yeah. So there are some like kind of darlings that you're kind of still having in the closet and it's like, okay, just one. or just, just only one. one. Okay. Just one. Yeah. <laughs> I see. And yeah. that will be like the next game or is there still like a game in between to There's a game in between. It, try it again. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We're working our way up there. Yes. Um, so yeah, that's our, that's our goal. Trying a way to take the risk. Basically, that's what you're doing. It's all comes down to risk mitigation. Uh, at the end of the day, and the more experience we have, yeah, proves to investors and publishers that we'll be able to deliver what we promise. Oh wow, that's an interesting story because like there's all like there are also groups that just go for the one ID and they just hope that it's going to succeed. And you were like, wait, that moment that's like too much of a risk, especially I think if you accept that money right from the publisher, you kind of also in depth if you don't deliver is that the way how it goes oh i don't even want to think about the legal repercussions <laughs> of not delivering but yeah you would be severely at risk and yeah i mean that's why you create a company you don't do it personally you know mm -hmm. but your company yeah, would sure. definitely be in default mm -hmm. um and your company would be riddled with debt and then you'd probably have to file for bankruptcy and all those things which thank god that didn't happen because we delivered the game whether the the, the, the game sells is is a different story but in regards to rough justice you know we got really lucky uh with Dedelic, and they came on board pretty late it was like six months before release is when we signed with them but they were gracious enough to agree to not only the pc release but also the, the ports which we haven't publicly mentioned yet the game will be released on switch xbox and playstation oh exciting yeah okay yeah but then you because i played it with mouse and keyboard right mm -hmm. so then also like the it'll be full controller support uh, for pc as well but uh, then the controls will be also different so it will also influence the ux right mm -hmm. so what are the, the challenges for that because it's it feels really like a, a keyboard mouse game to be honest yeah i think that you know some people have been playing it with the controller set we have now we were now we have partial controller support but I, again it's one of those games where once you understand the concept of it, it it can be a pretty chill game but yeah optimizing uh the controller support is is important but none of us are actually controller players for all pc players <laughs> and so it, it, it again you're doing something that you like to do and like the idea of me sitting on my couch and mm -hmm. doing qa with a controller and I'm like, I can be so much more precise if I have a keyboard and a mouse, you know? And it's like, I just, um, yeah. Yeah, how is it for like a small team to find like the play terms? Is the publisher helping with that? Or is it more like you try to get your community ready? So last summer we released our alpha demo, which is like a pre-version, a demo of the game, a very short, small version of the game. And uh, we found a bunch of really, really cool people that really, really like the game, streamers. Um, we reached out to a bunch of people. Uh, we used uh, Lorkit and Press Engine, two services that you can you can use. I don't know. Honestly, I didn't really put too much thought into it. I reached out to these people. Hey, do you want this key to the game? You can check it out. You know, you have an arrangement with them. They play the game for an hour, an hour and a half, and, uh, and a lot of people did that, which is great. And then you have other people who like wanted to play the game and ended up playing it for six hours on stream. And you're like, oh, okay. I mean. It, <laughs> cool you know <laughs> Why not? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's two different types of people people that are like eh, it's too complicated for me i don't want to get into it and other people that are just like they get really get their teeth sunk into it you know when we've had so many streamers even for release we had so many streamers that were like oh we're gonna play it for play it for an hour and end up playing it for four five six eight hours one person even played for eight hours straight on on stream and that makes you feel good all of a sudden you think to them oh now it clicks now this is fun and this game will make so much sense and then the grind starts and then you always want to get this next upgrade or this next thing and that makes you really really feel good as a developer when you have these people that are into it you know and really enjoy what they're doing okay that's cool cool to hear so you were kind of hinting that the game is not going that well on the shelves or is that 
that I just kind of picked up. I think for a new game from a new team, releasing a, a game that isn't one particular genre, it's going to be very difficult. And also, I think indie games in general, you know, the market is very, very saturated. Yes. Yeah, any of the information that I'd tell you anyways, you can easily find out if you go to Steam database or something yeah, like that. Yeah. Um, but, you know, is it uh, this huge, like, uh, sleeper hit where we're selling billions and billions of copies per day? No, it's not. But I think that how the industry works, from my understanding so far, at least, is that, you know, you're looking for a recoup within not six months or a year, you know, or even more over time, because, you know, you're looking at different Steam sales and, uh, and there's also other games where they've been on the market for six months and all of a sudden a streamer picks it up and then it explodes. So I think, you know, we're not throwing in our towel and saying, well, you know, it's a, it's a dead horse. We're thinking to ourselves, okay, it would have been great if it, we released and, you know, it was be on the Steam front page, but that wasn't the case. It is what it is. We're proud of what we brought to the market. We've also been doing a lot of updates since the release. We're planning another major update for the fall to coincide with the console releases. So, I mean, we're not just dropping it. Yeah, we've accepted that. Again, we're very proud of what we've achieved so far. Nice. Yeah. And if you would have all the money in the world, what would you have, or, and you need to redo this project, what would you have done? Redo the project. Huh, that's a good question. Uh, m well, money doesn't necessarily correlate with time. And I think, I mean, you know, before we, re we released, about a month and a half before we released, maybe two months, the publisher was like, hey, it'd be really cool if we put together an art book for the release. And I was like, we're releasing like in two months. It's like, <laughs> now it's like all hands on deck. You want to put together an art, art book? But luckily enough, we had saved everything. We've chron uh, chronicled all of the development of the game. And so we we're able to put together an art and design book over 220 pages uh, long of the whole process. And uh, one of the most interesting sections of this art and design book was the, there's a chapter called the Dead Darlings. All these ideas that we had that we had to kill um, or you know, based on time or based on budget or things like that. Because as I mentioned before, starting out new, you, know, you, you end up biting off more than you can chew you're gonna have to kill features or content just so you can actually m m hit your targets. And that is totally normal. Our particular Dead Darlings list was quite extensive simply for the fact that we didn't have that, that, that background. We didn't have that, that experience yet. But luckily in this break, this huge existential crisis that we had, we actually looked at everything together as a team and we just said, okay, we're gonna vote you know, all these different features, are we going to put it in or not? Are you going to fight for it? Are you going to make it happen? We you know we can, out of these hundred features, we can only just pick 20 of them. So let's do this together. And that was a really cool experience that we we did that. But of course, you know, our Miro board that we use, Miro is this uh, whiteboard that we use to design everything. You know, it's filled with all these different ideas. You know, for instance, uh, with the puzzles, at the end of the day, we had 21 genre and era specific puzzles, but um, those are the only ones that made it into the game. We have another 80 puzzles that we, in various stages of development, where you know, some of them are just sketches on napkins. Other ones, we actually got into the prototype stage. You know, I think a game like this, you know, sure, we could have made a lot more really, really cool uh, puzzles. We probably could have worked a little bit more on the modular design for our cases, I think, to make them more interesting. But yeah, again, all those things come from experience. I don't know if I answered your question. Maybe I did. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> well, I said, what would you do different? But this is an interesting way to say, like, whoa, we just basically did it already very different than we suspected it to be. So that's yeah. also interesting. Yeah, I was also wondering, because your game is, like, very... Like, because I really like level design myself, like, how is it to make a level design for this kind of game? Because it also feels that there's a lot of randomized stuff, but not all of it. So I think from a technical perspective, uh, what we aim to achieve is that uh, we actually create created our own tool to create the buildings throughout the whole map. And what you would do is you would be able to section off a, a block it's, it's a seed generator and it would actually create the buildings that you want and you can actually change the density of the buildings, the height of the buildings, the, the type and the style of the buildings, if it's industrial buildings. So yeah, I mean, but creating that tool from the beginning made it a lot easier for us to actually implement the actual level design. It looks very simplistic, but, and it is, 
but I think there is beauty in that simplicity. You know, there's no need to have look into windows and see people. Quite often, less is more. And especially, it was a good call because to make sure that this game is optimized for the Switch and other uh, last-gen consoles, it works, works for us. You know, it's not important to necessarily see traffic signs or even traffic. You leave those things up to your imagination. You know, you see your agents moving around on the map. But yeah, we did spend a lot of time making this tool, though, <laughs> to, to make sure that it actually delivered for what we uh, we needed it to, and also that it was optimized. I think we covered a lot, but like we haven't really covered the audio. Only you mentioned like with the names of songs, but what was the in between of the audio decision? We worked together with our composer, Ralph, and he did an amazing job. And Ralph is an amazing artist, and he he works a lot for Hollywood. He does a lot of Hollywood trailers for a lot of famous movies, and uh, you know he really, really wanted to make the soundtrack. And I was like, man, I can't, I can't afford for you. You're like, we you work for Hollywood. He's like, he's like, well, we'll come up with something, but I, it's important for me that I actually make a complete soundtrack on my own, you know, for a game. That's what I really want to do. And I'm like, well, I can help you out there. And so it was really, really cool. And I think when it came to the soundtrack, you know, I think we at the end of the day there's like 14 tracks, and uh, he really wanted references and inspiration. And so one of our authors, Jared from New York City, he, um, this is probably one of the, the coolest things he ended up doing for the game. He ended up having to put together a lot of references. You know, like, this is the type of song we're looking for, this is the atmosphere we're looking for, as opposed to writing, like, um, cases or the story for the game, you know, putting together. And he's also in a band as well, so it, w it was interesting for him to, to put together something like that. So it was great working together with Ralph, so we knew what we, exactly what we were getting. Also, we worked very closely with uh, Mike Bodie, who is a, an actor. He's an American actor based in London. He is a voice director as well. He did uh, all the voice directing for the English version of the game. And we had uh, some pretty big names in, in the game as well. So, yeah, it was really, really good. Again, all remote. We worked primarily with actors that had their own studio. And if not, they had to come to uh, an external studio. But yeah, um, that was definitely a, a nice experience. And then they reached to you, if I'm correct? Or it was more like you were reaching to them? Well, I've known them. These are people that work together with me on other projects. I may not be the best project lead, maybe, but one thing I can do is I know people. You know, if someone handed me all the money I needed to make uh, our other game, you know, I would be able to put together a team of like 30 people in like two days. comes down to who you know in the business mm -hmm. and yes. who you know can, they can get stuff done. I know people and try and I think finding the right person to do the job is important. Uh, yes, for sure. Yeah. Okay, so you're talking about like a lot like before this. Yeah. Okay, Jeremiah, what did you do before this? What did I do before game development? Yes. Well, I founded two game localization studios, but that was a while ago. But I've been doing voiceover work for the last 20 years. Ah, that's I, I studied acting in New York and I after a few years of being a voice actor, I got into game game voices and I became a casting director and a voice director and then founded these two game localization studios. Then I exited maybe 10 years ago, both of them. And then I was just back to doing just voiceover work. Yeah, and then I had the inkling of becoming a, a game developer and started working on our initial title, Cold Comfort. Nice. Um, and uh, yeah. And then I'm just thinking, right? Are you also secretly in the game? Oh, 100%. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and it's interesting because you know, I mean, obviously it's my game, so you know, I, I could have played the main character if I wanted to or something like that. But I ended up playing a lot of minor roles, probably like twenty different minor roles. You know, it's got like one line here or ten lines here, nice. um, so you can hear me a lot in the game. So, okay, yeah. then that's only you from the, from the team, or like only like, me from the team. Yeah. Okay. Oh, interesting. Okay, yeah. nice. So you kind of push yourself into it with your other, like, your before career. Yeah, 100%, yeah. Okay, that's cool. Oh, wow, this is a very interesting interview in this kind of regard. <laughs> <laughs> like, a lot of my viewers, they are interested in, like, maybe starting for themselves an indie studio or also diving into it. Like, what would be your starting advice, like, your starting kit? You're like, okay, if you kind of follow these kind of things, of course, it's challenging, but then you will have uh, a good success, most likely. I think, you know, what everyone's going to tell you is start off small. And that's exactly what I didn't do. Um, and uh, with my first game, you know, making a multiplayer asymmetrical zombie first person shooter mm -hmm. 
definitely was not small. You know, and I, and I paid for it in the sense that earned a lot of valuable experience and the game still hasn't been done yet. And I had to like, you know, refocus. But I think that quite often this industry works with you know, like what what titles have you do you have? If you want people to take you seriously in the business, I think being flippant and having a big idea like I did, you know, it didn't necessarily work to my advantage. And I think now that we have product to market, it makes it that much more realistic. I'm not saying that we will find a publisher or an investor for the next game. Who knows? Maybe it doesn't work out, you know, but I'm pretty confident we will. Uh, and our, our chances are significantly increased now that we've brought something to market. And again, this whole bringing something to market, it's like you have your foot in the door. And then again, the whole idea of making something small and even we probably should have done something even way smaller than Rough Justice 84 to make it for our first title and slowly build ourselves up and to earn that that reputation. Yeah, that definitely be the first thing. Also, finding other like minded individuals. I think for me, everyone who's involved in the team, they're they're specialists in their particular area. And I think that with these other companies I founded in the past, one was a three person constellation. The other one was an eight person constellation. So all had equal ownership of the company that presents completely different challenges. But at the same time, you are making these choices together. And what I don't have right now, you know, it's like I'm making all these choices by myself, like for the company and the business development. And again, you know, I can't stress that enough that making a game isn't just making a game. You know, you don't neg negate and don't think to yourself, well, I'll get someone else to do that. No, you know, if you you want to make a game, who the who's the best person to promote your game or to pitch it to investors? It's you, you know, because it's your game. Mm -hmm. um, and just be fully aware that being a developer is being a businessman or a business person. You know, you need to understand that. And again, I made that mistake. I'm like, I just want to make a game. You know, I'll get the, have the publisher do all the businessy stuff. You know, no. And I think that you know, if you ever want to get any money from the game, from a publisher or an investor, you need to have an, an air of, of professionality. It's all about that respect and um, people uh, trusting you that you yeah, can actually- I think deliver. also a big element of what I noticed is authenticity should yeah. also be there. I don't know. I mean, I've seen so many games that have been funded where you think to yourself, oh, okay, well, it's just like that game, but all right, whatever. You know, um, okay. I think it's more comes down to from a, uh, an investor perspective. I'm sure, you know, there's investors that, that invest with their heart uh, and publishers that also invest with their gut. You know, a lot of times you think to yourself, well, we're definitely going to break even if we invest in this game, even though this is a carbon copy of this game with a slight twist. Again, it's risk mitigation. And I think that if you have all those check boxes, you know, like, has, has the, the team been together? You know, have they worked together uh, on, on an extended period of time? Have they brought a product to market? Do they know how to do these things? You know, is the new game that they're promoting, uh, is it completely out of their wheelhouse? Um, these are just basic standard um, investor or publisher checklist elements. Wow, we have in this talk, we just like kind of talked a lot about publishers and investment. That's yeah, really sure. interesting. That's really cool. Yeah. yeah, so so much advice in that regard. Well, again, unsolicited advice. Um, you know, I'm not a lawyer. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm a, and I, and I, again, I don't want to come across as if I know everything. I don't. This mm -hmm. is, you know, I, even though I've been involved in game development for a long time, I just just brought my first game to market. And there's so many people out there that have way more experience than I do. So take what I say with as a grain with a grain of salt. You know? Yeah, I mean, everyone's story is different, right? But it's interesting that we can learn from every every story. That's basically why I hold these interviews to to like learn from all different experiences on the on the indie uh, dev market. Yeah. Yeah. So I think we are kind of closing to wrap this up. Yeah. What would be your last last advice or your last no that you're like, yes, I want to say this as my last part of the interview? I think this is more um, directed toward any aspiring game developers out there is that, I mean, it sounds cheesy, but don't give up. There's going to be so many doubters out there that people are going to be like, well, all right, well, good luck with that one. You know, and I've heard that so many different times. And, you know, I'm not a spiteful person, but there's a sense of pride for me that all the people that have disregarded my visions of grandeur, I suppose, um, you know, and a lot of these people were right to, like I mentioned before, you know, not give me all these this money to make this other game, this first person shooter game. At the end of the day, they were right. All their misgivings were were well founded. Being able to take feedback from people and disseminate that and to turn it around is an important skill set. And it's something I'm still learning to do this, uh, today. But if you go around and you say to yourself, well, I'm going to make a game come hell or high water, 
but how you do it is super important. You know, look, I, I finally brought a game to market. Is it the game I wanted to bring to market? No, it's a game that it turned out to be. But being able to be to being flexible and have that tenacity and, and to have grit and just not give up. There's been so many times where I'm like, well, I don't know how I'm going to do this. This is insane. You know, just believing in yourself. You know, we all suffer, suffer from, you know, imposter syndrome to a certain degree. But, you know, who doesn't? If they don't, then they're good for them. You know? <laughs> well, then you most likely not grow, right? When you, every time when you like, reset your barriers or like your yeah. challenges, then you kind of... You're uncertain, right? And then sure. you're taking risks. So any person that takes risks or do something new, they most likely will be hit by imposter syndrome. Um, 100%. Yeah. Just stay true to yourself and, and never give up. Never surrender. Never surrender. <laughs> I like that. A, no, no, never surrender. Okay. So uh, thank you very much for all your Good wisdom job. and sharing such like, uh, well, personal story with the game. Uh, sure. I'm sure that a lot of people are like, whoa, out of their mind, like, oh, this is the story behind Earl of Justice. So that's yeah. a uh... That was only a little tiny fraction of it, but yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much for your interest um, and for reaching out to me. I really, really appreciate it. Yeah. That's... And if anyone has any follow-up questions for me, they can hit me up. I guess it's going to be on YouTube. Whoa, that was a lot of information. I hope you enjoyed it. I did. It was a long one, but I think it was really worth it. So as Jeremiah already said, you can also ask more questions in the comments below. Give a like or subscribe. For next time, we are going to stay a little bit in the board game, but this time with Stacklands, which is a very interesting and unique game. And also the way how they kind of promote their game or place them on the market is very extraordinary. So I hope you're excited for that interview. So see you there, create more, enjoy more. This was A Creates.